I tried to imagine a fellow smarter than myself, and then I tried to think, what would he do? Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, nootropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. I'm your host, Jesse Lawler, excited to bring you episode number 105 of this podcast dedicated to the ongoing improvement of your brain, my brain, all of our brains, by any and all means at our collective disposal. One of the things that we get a lot of questions about, and for good reason, is the racetam family of chemicals. If you're a listener to this show, you've almost certainly heard of paracetam. It is the original compound to be given the name nootropic. It's an old chemical from the 1960s, well, at least old as synthetic compounds go. It's got a storied history and it's led to a spin-off body of chemicals, many of which, although not all of which, have the suffix racetam. And this week, we're going to be talking with Dr. Andrew Hill. He's been on the show before. He's a neuroscientist from Los Angeles, California. He lectures at UCLA for budding neuroscientists. He works with neurofeedback systems. He's one of the founding partners of a company called True Brain that has several different nootropic compounds on the market. But we're going to be having a conversation today about racetams, old and new, the original racetams, piracetam, aniracetam, and oxiracetam, as well as a lot of the Johnny-come-lately racetams, compare contrast some of the things that are going on between the different chemicals how to keep them straight why it matters what they do all of that stuff that'll be in the main interview If you hang around until the very end of the episode, I'm going to tell you about a piece of research that tickled my funny bone. This is legitimate scientific research, but it also, apparently the paper included the word bullshit some 200 plus times, which has got to be some kind of record. So if you're curious, as I was, what new breakthroughs science is making into the world of bullshit, hang around until the end of the episode and the ruthless listener retention gimmick. But now, as usual, let's kick things off with This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts. This week in neuroscience. So somebody forwarded me this article, which had the simple title, Risk Takers Are Smarter, which was definitely interesting enough to get me to read it. Although it's somewhat of a misleading title, as we will talk about in a second here. But there's a really interesting study done recently by researchers at the University of Turku in Finland, and they were looking specifically at the brains of 34 young men of the ages of 18 and 19. So a very specific group by both age and sex, and they were studying the brains of these guys and also watching how they behaved when playing a video game where they're car drivers, they're trying to get Get across town in a hurry, they've got a cascade of changing lights, they can choose to stop and be responsible or occasionally run yellow lights and it's a race and all that. So they did the things you might imagine first, they let all the kids play the game for a while before they actually tested them on it to make sure that the kids that were more adept in video games weren't getting an unfair advantage. They monitored their brains with both fMRI and diffusion tensor imaging, and finally they built a profile of which of these kids were more risk averse or risk prone based on their driving behaviors within the game. According to researcher Dagfin Mo, what they expected to find was that the young men who spent more time considering a decision when they were coming up on an intersection with a yellow light would have more highly developed neural networks in their brains than those who make quick decisions and take risky chances. But instead, they found exactly the opposite. It turned out that the guys that were willing to take more risks had better developed areas of white matter in their brain than the low risk takers, specifically in areas like the prefrontal cortex and within interhemispheric tracts, and in the rear of the brain in an area that controls vision. This finding surprised the researchers initially, but they came around to the idea that this probably has a lot to do with brain plasticity, and the people that are less risk averse, that are more willing to take risks and might even seek out risks, have had much greater opportunity even by 18 or 19 years of age for learning and developing these areas of white matter. So the bumps and bruises and learning opportunities that the high risk takers have accrued over the course of their life, assuming that they've survived to this point, have given them better developed brains, says Mo. Daring and risk willingness activate and challenge the brain's capacity and contribute towards learning, coping strategies, and development. Society must stop regarding daring and risk willingness simply as undesirable and uncontrolled behavior patterns. Following up on this, the researchers are planning a new educational study to investigate educational approaches directed towards both high and low risk seekers. Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast where smart people talk about smart drugs. Got a couple of nice Thanksgiving gifts from listeners on iTunes, a couple of five-star reviews. One from Barracuda Bud, who said, one episode in and already hooked. The guys from the Mind Pump podcast have boasted about this show several times, and it did not disappoint. Well, thank you to Barracuda Bud, and thank you to the hosts over at Mind Pump for saying nice things about us. That is really awesome. And Dubs 94 said, my favorite podcast of all time. It's so informative and interesting that I actually look forward to getting stuck in traffic just so I can listen to more Smart Drug Smarts. That is a perverse compliment if ever there was one. I hope you're not stuck in traffic right now, but thank you so much for saying that. And thanks to everyone who is out there spreading the word on the podcast behalf. It's really, really appreciated. Nothing beats good word of mouth. 
Last Friday, as we all know, was Black Friday, the big shopping holiday, and then Cyber Monday. Prior to this year, I'd never really had anything to do with retail, so it was only from a consumer perspective that I knew that this stuff was kind of a big deal, but having seen the sales chart of what was going on over at axonlabs.io, our retail sales site this past week, wow, those days really do make a difference. It's It was a very, very funny thing to see. We still have a 15% across-the-board sale going on over at axonlabs.io. If you were not one of those Black Friday or Cyber Monday people, but you you've been curious about trying out Nexus, our cognitive stack, or Mitogen, our mitochondrial booster, now is a great time to pick up either or both of those. Get some extra savings, knock some people off your holiday list with small, easy-to-ship packaging. Good for the body, good for the brain, but thanks to those of you who have already gone and picked up some of those products for the holidays. And thanks also to those of you who are recent sign-ups to the Smart Drug Smarts newsletter, which we are affectionately referring to as the Brain Breakfast. Going to have something kind of special in there this coming week. Not just neuroscience news from around the web, but also a, I guess you'd call it kind of an opinion slash book report piece that I just wrote up based on a really interesting book that I read recently. I'll leave it at that. I'll try to dangle that carrot a little bit in case you haven't signed up yet. Smartdrugsmarts.com slash newsletter if you want to get on that list. But more time for that later. Lots still to cover. Let's move on to the main interview. Smart Drug Smarts. So we've been lucky enough to have Dr. Andrew Hill on. This is actually his third time. So we're kind of making this a good, solid, once-a-year type thing, except I I think it's actually going to be more frequent than that because the first time we spoke, we spoke about neurofeedback, which is kind of his first love in the realm of neuroscience. He is doing neurofeedback now at a place called Peak Brain LA. And during the course of this interview, in which we don't really talk very much about neurofeedback at all, but stick to the racetams, he dropped a bit of an invitation for me to head by their offices over at Peak Brain LA. And I I think I'm going to call that bluff. If he didn't mean for that to be a real invitation, I'm just going to show up anyway. It sounds like they're doing great stuff over there. He's also the lead neuroscientist at a supplement company called True Brain, which we talked about in an earlier episode. True Brain is spelled T-R-U Brain. You can find them online at truebrain.com. And they've got a couple of supplements based around paracetam, oxiracetam, and a host of other ingredients. We're going to be talking all about the racetam family of compounds and the conversation that you're about to hear. It's fast-paced. It's interesting. Dr. Hill is just a wealth of information. So get your notepad handy and let's jump in with Dr. Andrew Hill. So, you know, I'm not 100% sure if a lot of the newest things called racetams actually are. I know at least a few of them, and I'm not sure which ones at this point, but a few of the most recent ones actually have no structural similarity to paracetam. They're just given the racetam name because they're nootropics, and that's what people think of as nootropics. But if you back up and use the sort of first round of racetams, like paracetam, oxyracetam, aniracetam, pramiracetam, phenylparacetam, etc., all of these are fairly similar compounds, with the exception maybe of phenylparacetam, which is a little bit different. And the racetams, the story goes, scientists were trying to develop a sleep medication, a sleep drug, because nothing works for sleep. There's no such thing as a sleep medication. There are no drugs out there that make you fall asleep. It doesn't exist. There are drugs out there that put you in a hypnotic state and shut off your monkey mind a little bit. And if you're tired and there's there's a sleep urge that can rise, then you fall asleep from that hypnotic state. But no sleep medication on the market, and there's never been one, actually triggers the sleep reflex. Doesn't happen. And so it's always a holy grail of, you know, drug researchers to find a really true sleep med. They took the neurotransmitter GABA. GABA is a calming or relaxing neurotransmitter. It's actually the only neurotransmitter in the brain that always acts as an inhibitory neurotransmitter, meaning when cells are bound to by GABA, they are less likely to fire. And the opposite, uh, if you will, compound is called glutamate. Glutamate is always excitatory. Cells always want to fire more when receiving glutamate. Every other neurotransmitter is either excitatory or inhibitory, depending on which circuit, which cell it's actually coming out of or touching. But GABA, universally relaxing, calming, sedating, having some alcohol releases a lot of GABA. And that calm, relaxed, kind of warm sensation you have after a drink or two, that's a pretty strong GABA experience. And so these paracetam, eventually paracetam researchers, started off trying to make a new sleep drug, and they started off with the neurotransmitter GABA and went, okay, GABA is calming. Let's see if we can modify it biochemically and see what the effects are. And they, in a biochem lab, started adding rings and molecules and carbons and everything else to GABA and eventually found a few different versions of altered GABA that still contain a ring, a ring of organic compounds in um, GABA called the pyrrolidine ring. 
And this actually is the characteristic of a racetam. The racetam has the pyrrolidine ring. It's very obvious if you look at the structure of paracetam. Some of the newest things like coluracetam and fasoracetam, it's much less obvious. And so this is why I'm not sure those things would be considered racetams. In fact, even Nupept, which people say is a derivative from paracetam, doesn't really have the same chemical structure. So I would say it's not actually a racetam. But all that being said, the, this compound that they developed When they tested it on animals, instead of making the animals fall asleep, it made them sort of explore the environment more. And they went, oh, okay, this doesn't work as a sleep drug, but what does it do in, uh, you know, in animals? And after some testing, they found that it seemed to improve attention and it seemed to improve oxygenation in the brain. And this is actually how paracetam was used initially for the first several years. It was used for a couple specific cases. One was after people had experienced near drowning And so they were hypoxic, had oxygen starvation to their brain tissue. And paracetam was used as post-drowning therapy to help your brain recover. And it was used, I think, in in Russia as a post-alcoholic recovery medication, sort of rebuild all the damage you'd done with, you know, years of binge drinking and things. And it works pretty well for those things. And after that, historically, in other countries, not in the U.S., but other countries, it's been used for mild cognitive impairment and ADHD and study drugs and other sorts of things like that. Paracetam uh, ended up being incredibly safe, almost non-toxic. It's so safe. Like it's pretty much impossible to feed an animal enough paracetam for it to be dangerous. It just can't happen. The safety profile is incredibly good. And this is one of the reasons why nootropics started to get, I think, used is because there's very little downside to a true nootropic. You know, I'm not talking about things like modafinil, which do have side effects, or caffeine, which has side effects. Talking about the true category of no side effects, and yet they still improve your focus, your cognition, your memory, your stress response, something. Yeah, I'm so glad you bring up that distinction because the term nootropics is thrown around so cavalierly these days when it's not really talking about what the actual definition is. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's become a marketing term and people are lumping in all kinds of smart drugs and off-label prescription drugs and research chemicals. And I think that the general public is being badly served by that definition getting, you know, some creep. If you're trying to improve a deficit, going after a drug with side effects might make sense. But if you're trying to squeeze an extra 5 or 10% out of your focus, your day, your stress response, whatever it is, then you shouldn't be trying to balance side effects versus gains. You should be going after things that only give you a little bit of benefit and nothing that actually has side effects to manage. And that is really the category definition of nootropics here, right? And of course, as you know, the other piece of the classic definition is neuroprotective. Nootropics actually make brain injuries and, and other toxins you experience less damaging damaging typically. So that's the broad category. Paracetam, of course, was the poster child. And then the, the I think the first two that were derived from paracetam are called oxyracetam and aniracetam. Very similar effects, ultimately. They all have sort of a, a sensory acuity piece. They all uh, add a little bit of focus. There's some verbal fluency that goes up. There's some calming. There's some focusing. But they're a little bit different. The more we get into what different racetams do, the less clear the science is. There isn't a lot of science. I mean, paracetam has been studied for decades. Aniracetam, Oxyracetam have been studied for you know a decade or two. But the newest things, coliracetam, fasoracetam, sufaram, those things have no history behind them. And some of these compounds actually are things that some random Redditor found on a scientific article, copied the formula down, sent it to China, and had a bulk powder delivered three months later that they're selling. There's not a lot of deep research into some of these most common newest racetams. To the point where a lot of the scientists that develop them say, please don't take this, humans. It's just not ready. We don't know what it does. Right. If you are not a lab rat, you should not be taking this yet. Exactly. The self-hacker community, the biohacker, you know, Redditor crowd, you know, they have more bravery than sense sometimes, and they're happy to self-experiment and try lots of research chemicals. That's not the approach I've taken personally or for my friends and family, and it's definitely not the approach I've taken when helping to formulate True Brain. So I think that, you know, Erasitam is absolutely a great compound when thinking about building your own nootropic uh, strategy. But you should be thinking about the first handful of them, not things that have been developed in the past 18 months, which are a lot of the newest ones. I think that whenever you're putting random chemicals into your body, if there's been decades of experience with other people have had that show that they're safe and effective, that's really your first target. And only if you're trying to fix a really bizarre problem or you're suffering in some way, should you get more experimental and probably use your doctors or your, your MDs education 
information as well and consult with them through the process. But the subjective effects of paracetam, oxyracetam, and aniracetam, and paramiracetam are very similar, and they're probably doing similar things um, at the sort of cellular level. And we know of at least three or four things that paracetam is doing. Paracetam completely changes the flexibility of cell membranes, it makes them very flexible, very sort of a slippery, and this is probably upregulating activity of membrane receptors. It has to be. Now, that does bring us to one of the very few contraindications for racetams. Because paracetam, and I assume other racetams, improve cell uh, flexibility and permeability and a few other things, this is not just true for brain cells. This is true for cells in your body period. And of course, one of the cells are, um, well, they're not really cells, they're fragments of cells. They're called platelets. They're involved with clotting. So platelets actually are little tiny chunks of cell that break off of a larger cell. They have sort of sticky bits on them that get clogged up when blood is flowing and they form the, the seed of a clot, if you will. When you have paracetam on board, your platelets are a little bit more slippery. In theory, this is actually a wonderful thing because with aging, with other problems we have, clotting is a big problem. And so having some paracetam on board actually could be really helpful for that. And for me, that's one of the reasons I first selected it as a personal compound. I have a blood clotting feature called Leiden Factor 5. And Factor 5 is one of the blood clotting factors and Leiden is the scientist that discovered it. And if you have Leiden Factor 5, you are not able to shut off clotting as easily as you might want to. So you clot extra. And this is a much bigger problem for women than it is for men because it affects menstruation, childbearing, all kinds of things. It's much less of an issue for men who aren't receiving major surgery, but it's still somewhat of an issue. And so for me, and actually my whole family who has Leiden type 5, they're all on paracetam because it reduces the risks, in my opinion, of having sort of the increased risk of thrombosis or things, clots, essentially. So that's one of the benefits of it, but also it could get in the way if you aren't careful and you aren't aware of that feature. So if you're on blood thinners, for instance, warfarin, coumadin, and a lot of elders are on blood thinners to reduce cardiovascular load, you would probably not want to take paracetam and other racetams. At least you wouldn't want to without checking with your doctor to look for interactions. You also probably want, wouldn't want to take paracetam if you have impaired kidneys. Paracetam is eliminated by the kidneys, not the liver. It is as the primary mechanism for breakdown. So if you have kidney failure, adding more load to your kidneys would not be a good idea. But those are very discrete cases. And if you're on blood thinner, if you're hemophiliac, you know you have to be careful about the drugs and compounds you put in your body because lots of things affect clotting and affect your blood. And so it's not really a, a major concern, but it, you know, it does sort of point out one of the central mechanisms is this membrane flexibility piece that is pretty profound. And it probably is related to some of the mechanisms we also know. Paracetam seems to affect the mitochondria. Now, remember, the mitochondria are making energy inside the cell. Evolutionarily, the mitochondria were actually a different organism. Way back when, when we were, you know, swimming around the primordial ooze, uh, mitochondria were a, a less complex creature that we enfolded into our bodies. And then we developed a symbiotic relationship to, and eventually we took over reproduction for it, and it became part of our body. But it has this whole other genetic structure and complex complicated sort of internal structure that is different than the rest of our tissue in some ways. And it's very efficient at building ATP and other energy substrates. The problem is because there's energy being produced, a lot of chemical reactions happening, mitochondria also can pump out negative things called free radicals. And they pump out a little bit of free radicals as a, as a function of producing energy, but the sort of machinery of producing energy can get broken to the extent that mitochondria pump out a lot of free radicals and start oxidizing cells and causing DNA damage and lots of really negative things. This is one of the aging factors. It's sort of more broken mitochondria in your body. Now, mitochondria and the body's ability to handle mitochondria theoretically is smart enough to surmount this. And what should happen is uh, the cell should notice the mitochondria is pumping out reactive uh, oxygen species and other free radicals. And it should actually send a signal to the mitochondria to cause uh, apoptosis or programmed cell death. It's essentially saying, hey, mitochondria, you're broken. Clean yourself up. And the mitochondria self-destructs. And that causes another mitochondria or two to sort of develop in its place. When these cells get broken and damaged, the mitochondria and start pumping out free radicals, unfortunately, one of the things that happens in that damage process is they stop hearing the signal to self-destruct. And it seems, there's a couple papers showing that paracetam actually renews that ability and helps broken mitochondria hear the signal to clean themselves up and make room for new mitochondria. So that's the second thing it's doing. 
And then subjectively, most of the race attempts seem to improve visual attention. It's almost like the windshield wiper fairy comes by and squeegees your world. Things are a little bit crisper, a little bit clearer, not pushed the way a stimulant is, but this happens with SMR neurofeedback too. But with both paracetam and SMR neurofeedback, I've had folks try it, come back a few hours later and say, oh my God, I'm seeing better. Well, and you're not actually seeing better. Your visual cortex is probably more active and you're perceiving better. The gain is turned up a little bit, maybe, on your sensory system, but you're not actually transducing the signals any better from outside the world into your brain. Same lens, same retina, but your visual cortex might notice the colors and the shapes and the details a bit more because there's more activity now back there. And this does seem to be true across those, at least those first three, you know, Pira, Oxy, and Annie. And I think to some extent, the difference in those three is more cultural in terms of which countries and which, you know, regions have actually gotten into those drugs. Annie racetam is big in Japan. And Annie has a slight anxiolytic, a slight calming quality. Oxy is also, you know, again, similar to Pira, but Oxy seems to be a tiny bit more stimulating. Uh, subjectively, the, the True Brain user base gives us lots of supports. And for a long time, the capsule was paracetam based and the drinks were Oxy racetam based. Nowadays, actually, the drinks are both Oxy and Pira. We bumped up the strength that included some paracetam and they work, you know, even better. But the difference subjectively between paracetam and Oxy racetam is the Oxy seems to make things a little bit more interesting in a sensory way. Colors seem more interesting interesting, music is more fun to listen to. And so we're starting to see that people that want a more creative uh, use of their mind prefer oxyracetam. And folks that want a more crisp, linear focus seem to like the paracetam better. And of course, these things seem to synergize. So you take a little bit of paracetam and a little bit of oxyracetam, you suddenly get this sort of third effect that is a little bit like both, but not really like either. It's kind of like a very strong version of both but without the weird sort of pressure you can get when you dose a lot of either. Some of this is just trial and error, you know, both self-hackers on forums and myself and people trying things over the past, you know, decade. A lot of this uh, information is, is aggregating in, you know, what I call bro science, unfortunately. With Oxy and Annie and Paracetam, you know, there's a lot of research showing things that it does do. Paracetam improves the number of complex microstates in your EEG, for instance. And I've done a lot of research on, on Paracetam and Oxyracetam, and it seems to affect brain activity in the temporal and parietal cortices for sensory processing or something. We're not really sure beyond that really what a lot of these things are doing. And I think you really need to sort of just be cautious and low key about your own rush to modify and make smart choices, make choices for things that have low side effects that lots of people have proven works that have decades of experience. And as tempting as it is, you shouldn't go look for that string of letters and numbers as a research chemical just because, you know, somebody on a forum said it was amazing. There is no limitless drug. There is no NZT. Anything that alters you dramatically is not sustainable. Yeah, you're going to dip way below the baseline before you actually make it back to normal. Exactly. And then think about what happens when the doses wear off and these things are habit forming and addictive. And uh, so I, I think that anything that is dramatically altering, you, you know, you should really think about brain enhancers. If they alter you, if they change who you are in the moment, they are not sustainable. Even caffeine. You have four cups of coffee and you're like wired and jittery. That's not a sustainable state to live in day in, day out. You know, tolerance happens and the three cups of coffee turn into five cups of coffee over a couple of years or 10 cups of coffee over a decade. And at some point you got to sleep. Right. Sleep is necessary. Sleep is actually one of the key things you need to do to perform at a high level. Consolidation or moving memories from short to long-term storage doesn't really happen without sleep. Also, sleep washes the brain like a car wash with the, uh, the cerebral spinal fluid kind of goes through all the the outside uh, milieu of the brain, uh, outside the cells, and washes all the toxins away from the outside of the cells where they've built up the metabolic byproducts from neurons and glial cells. And if you stop sleeping, that those toxins build up, and you actually have dramatically impaired brain health. In fact, you can look at this in college student brains, because college students are the most sleep-deprived population we have access to. But a sleep-deprived brain on several different neuroimaging modalities, including fMRI, SPECT and PET, even EEG, a significantly sleep deprived or chronically sleep deprived brain has many of the same activity features as a depressed brain. So I would say that before you even think about nootropics, you need to get your diet and your sleep sorted. You need to have good sleep onset, meaning at will or within 20 minutes or so, 
good sleep maintenance. You aren't waking up more often than you have to at night. You know, if you have to get up to pee, great, go, you know, go for it. But if you're cresting through the ocean of sleep every hour, then you're never diving down into the deep, slow wave sleep, which is the sleep where you aren't dreaming. And that's actually the really important sleep for repair and restoration and washing the brain is that uh, delta, that deep, dreamless sleep. And, and after you know, days or weeks of that, you have a brain that is inflamed, that is depressed. You, of course, have no energy and no resources during the day either, unfortunately. But I believe that the race of TAMs never really made it into modern parlance, if you will, in this country because – the big pharma machine had billions invested into stimulants by then. And they work hard to protect their investment. I mean, they had budgets to spread fear, uncertainty, and doubt against things that would impair their bottom line. You know, for many years, one of the big drug companies that made uh, psychostimulant was sending an MD to all of the CHAD meetings in his region to tell all the parents and children at the CHAD meetings that neurofeedback didn't work for ADHD. Now, we know that's not true. It's about the most effective thing you can do for ADHD. It eliminates it typically in 30 to 40 sessions, gone, and typically gone for good. It's a non-drug, low side effect or no side effect intervention that retrains your brain. And that was a bit, I think, terrifying to the big pharma companies. And they started spending, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to spread misinformation. In the 70s and 80s, when the race of TAM started to become known in this country, they still weren't known by very many people, but they were, you know, getting into like books on brain hacking and things, even in the, in the early 80s. Massive, massive machine in this country for all of the different psychostimulants by then. And that was also, you know, when the ADHD diagnoses were getting sort of expanded. Uh, I, don't, I don't mean expanded by the actual criteria in the DSM. I mean expanded by like school nurses saying, your son Johnny has ADHD. He really needs Ritalin to the point where like 40% of kids in elementary schools are on Ritalin or Adderall because the nurse, school nurses and the teachers, you know, Adderall becomes a behavior intervention. Oh, this kid is hard to handle. Let's give them Adderall. It doesn't necessarily mean that everyone that gets these drugs just prescribed has attention problems. But unfortunately, just like any other psychostimulant, even without an attention problem, Adderall makes you feel focused. And so we have this other problem now of college campuses abusing the Adderalls absurdly. You know, it's really easy to get an Adderall pill for two bucks on any college campus. And something in the neighborhood of 65 or 70 percent of kids, this is a study I saw recently, 70 percent of college kids asked said, yes, they have taken stimulants not prescribed to them for study drugs. Yeah, that's crazy. That's an absurdly high number. And that's just people who are willing to say yes on a survey. This is true in the boardroom, too. Adderall is, is heavily abused in the boardroom. In the 70s and 80s, it was cocaine. Cocaine was the drug in the boardroom. Now it's Adderall, unfortunately. And people don't have like a built-in assumption about the inverted U curve of performance. The default assumption is the little is good, more is better. Exactly. And, and you know, even in the 70s and 80s, there was some stigma around cocaine. It was an illegal drug. So even if you were abusing it to become you know, highly productive, you still knew you were abusing an addictive illegal drug. I'm not sure that the stigma is quite as daunting for an Adderall or a Ritalin. Oh, you got some Adderall? Great, I'll try some. Sure, sure. And then people don't think of it as an illegal stimulant that they're abusing. They think of it as, oh, this is a medication that I happen to get. That's just foolish. It really misses the point that your goals for brain hacking should be to build resources, not to impose an altered state temporarily. Smart Drug Smarts. So thank you so very much to Dr. Hill for taking the time for that interview. Some great moments in there about racetams that things I don't think we'd heard before. Paracetam originally being used as a post-drowning therapy and some of those early uses recovery from alcoholic binging and such. Also, although we didn't refer to it by name, sort of a hat tip to an idea called the Lindy effect as it applies to pharmaceuticals. The Lindy effect is an idea that basically if something has been around for a long time, the chances are greater that it will continue to be around for a long time. That if no major flaw has been found yet, that there's a good chance that there might not be any major flaws to find, and thus a technology or a practice or a whatever might continue to have a long lifespan. Dr. Hill's point about not wanting to try something just because it has the suffix racetam, if it's one of the newer compounds that's only been around for a handful of months or years, is a very, very good point. And worth remembering, along with the old maxim, better safe than sorry, especially when it comes to your brain. One of the main attractions that most people find with the racetams is the neuroprotective benefits, but that whole safety factor of protecting your brain goes out the window if it's one of these chemical compounds that hasn't really been studied yet. It's kind of the chemical 
functional equivalent of inviting a bunch of third cousins who you've never really met but at least have your same last name to come stay with you through the holidays. It might work out okay, but it could turn into like a Christmas farce Chevy Chase disaster movie, so best tread carefully. Smart Drug Smarts, Ruthless Listener Retention Gimmick. Okay, so I think we should all tip our hat to a PhD candidate at the University of Waterloo in Ontario, Canada, named Gordon Pinnycook, who did probably one of the most mean-spirited but really, really funny thesis projects I've ever heard of. I'm not sure if he found this website or created a website, but basically he's got a website that is a new age bullshit generator. It just takes a bunch of sort of like heartwarmy buzzwords that are warm and fuzzy but kind of meaningless and strung them together in syntactically appropriate combinations. So it kind of sounds like some of this new age chicken soup for the soul flowery stuff but it's, it's just randomly generated word salad and he took a bunch of subjects and he tested their ranking of these randomly generated phrases so let me give you an example of the of the kind of things that are spat out by this random phrase generating website so i went to the site and i clicked the generate button and i got consciousness consists of ultra sentient particles of quantum energy quantum means a flowering of the angelic you and i are travelers of the totality that kind of thing. So anyway, a bunch of these phrases were generated and shown to people, shown to research volunteers, who were then asked to rate the profundity, how profound each of these statements was. Researchers were also asked to rate the profundity of some real quotes by sort of a new age spiritualist guru named Deepak Chopra, who was kind of the control case. And then finally, people were asked to read mundane statements, things like newborn babies require constant attention, things that might be factually true, but aren't necessarily profound or rich in deeper meaning. And then some longtime famous profound statements, things like a wet person does not fear the rain. And all these others were serving as control groups just to make sure that the participants weren't labeling everything that they saw as profound. Things were rated on a profundity scale of a one to five. And the average profoundness rating of the randomly generated profundities was 2.6. So pretty good. But where the study really gets both mean and funny at the same time is that there was apparently a strong statistical correlation between people that rated the randomly generated new age nonsense phrases as being profound and people who are generally less reflective, lower in cognitive ability as measured by verbal and fluid intelligence and numeracy, and more prone to ontological confusion. And just to be clear, so it doesn't seem like the study is picking on people that have a particular liking for New Age stuff, it's not saying anything about those people's intelligence. Where it's seeing the negative intelligence correlation is people that can't tell the difference between fake New Age stuff that's just generated out of randomly assembled words and profound statements that have been around forever or that are at least generated by real thinking, breathing New Age gurus who presumably have something to say. Long story short, what they're saying is that people who are likely to misidentify profundity in randomly generated statements are probably not the sharpest tacks in the drawer, which might not really be breaking new ground in science. You could, probably could have inferred that without having done a study, but nevertheless, really clever experiment design, really funny website, and I'll link to the paper as well if you want to see the paper that almost certainly will go down in history as having more references to bullshit than any other scientific paper in the history of the world. Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast so smart, we have smart in our title, twice. Okay, you heard it. That is all of episode number 105. Thank you for hanging around until the very end. As I always like to say around the end of the episode, if you enjoyed this episode of Smart Drug Smarts, and you got some friends, family members, whomever, that you think might be interested in the kind of stuff that we talk about here, there's no better time than the holidays to spread the word about cool stuff that you like. Telling somebody about Smart Drug Smarts is a very cheap gift, but potentially a very, very valuable one. So drop them a link to iTunes, drop them a link to smartdrugsmarts.com, where, by the way, all the show notes for this week's episode will be online at smartdrugsmarts.com slash 105. I'll be back at you next week, as usual, on Fridays, and with that same unflagging commitment to helping you fine-tune the performance of your own brain. Have a great week, and stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts Podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smart should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.